sectional uh, sectional technical specialist Ian McAdam and uh, singles and dance judge Megan LaPointe. They are both part of the adult skating committee as well. So I appreciate them being here for me. And I'm going to turn this over to Ian, who is the, brain, uh, the brains behind this PowerPoint. So thank you very much, Ian. Hi, uh, welcome everyone. I hope you find this uh, very informative. And we do have a little bit at the end where we'll be able to ask some questions. So um, if we can wait till then with them, and then we can maybe go over them and if there's any uh, further clarifications. And thank you, Stephanie, for getting this going and to Cassie at headquarters. So hopefully, nope. Let's try that again. Browser, OK. Uh, hang on, technical difficulties here. Is this the one? No. There we go. OK, so as uh, we were saying, we're going to be talking about the spins and how they relate uh, with the judging system that we're all now very familiar with. And we will start off. Um, there are a number of documents that are available, and they're all uh, on the US figure skating uh, website. Uh, one of them comes from the International Skating Union and has a list of uh, 13 different available features. I'm not gonna go through them all. Uh, there are a number of them here, uh, or they're all listed here, I should say. Um, most of them don't change. But we have, within the adult community, added the option to uh, number 10, which allows at least eight revolutions without a change in position or variation in the sit spin. And essentially, this is what we're going to go over, how you can maximize your points within uh, the adult clarifications and what uh, features are required. Uh, can be a little bit uh, made easier. and. Um, you know, more available uh, for different skaters. Uh, at various different levels, you can see that uh, pre-bronze and bronze can max out at level one. Then with silver, it goes to two. Gold is level three. And then the intermediate, novice, junior, senior levels can get a maximum level four. Uh, and with the exception of the, if there's a no level call, a V can also be assigned. So for example, you could receive a level two V or a level two. Uh, one of the spins that does not have levels for, uh, because there's really not a lot can be done there is a two foot spin uh, with the code two FT USP. And that's either confirmed where you will see a one, it does not stand for a level just to say that it's confirmed or if it's not confirmed, there will be no number after it. Uh, to be eligible, uh, the features will increase the level. The basic position uh, must be attained in the spin. Uh, we will go forward on that. It is possible also that a non-visible position may be called as a non-basic if it meets the specific criteria within the spin. And then that would be eligible uh, for the non-basic position uh, feature. So basic positions, uh, we're starting off with a sit spin and there you can see a lovely example of one. The basic sit position uh, to get the features means that the thigh level must be parallel to the ice uh, or a little bit lower. So the upper part of the skating leg is at least parallel to the ice. If it is higher than that, it would not be considered um, a basic sit position but it could come under the category of, and as you can see in the one below, uh, the visible sit position. So it's not more than say about 45 degrees uh, to the horizontal plane when it's being done. Okay, for uh, the camel spin, uh, in the basic camel position, the free leg has to be higher than the hip level. Um, layback, uh, Bielman, and similar position ones usually get uh, are categorized within the upright spin position. And the one we don't really want to see is the drooping free leg, where it's about parallel to the ice, 
um, but it has gone below uh, the, the hip level uh, criteria for that. Uh, and the torso also has got to be retaining a parallel um, to the ice surface position for that. If it gets any higher, then you're most likely going to be seeing it moving into the upright category uh, from there. Um, I'll jump in there. So one of the things we can award on for the GOEs is a clear position. So if you're achieving that true basic position, you know, for the camel, you should see a straight line from your head to your free leg. That's going to be something that we can reward with as a clear position, as long as it's well controlled. Um, whereas the visible position, if you have the drooping free leg, something we can deduct for is for, they call it like unesthetic position, which is something that's been added. Uh, well, in variations, it's been added, but that can be something that can be deducted on. Okay. And the final, the upright position, sorry, I couldn't find a good upright position spin, um, is the basic one. And that's um, any position where the skating leg is slightly extended or bent. Um, the body is upright, as you can see from the, the diagram, and uh, it's not considered a camel position. So you've got a more upright position, hence the well, upright spin. Uh, okay. So, moving on. So, for this is going to bring us now into uh, the positions uh, when you're, or the levels that you can get when you're going into a spin. Uh, once you've got those basic positions in hand, then you start to build onto it, and then you start getting your levels that are going there. So, if you're doing a spin in one position without a change of foot, which would be, for example, an upright spin, USP, or a camel spin, CSP. Uh, if you've got no basic position within the spin, that's obviously not going to give you any level. A level base uh, uh, is a visible spin position for the set of the camel with two continuous revolutions in that visible position and three revolutions total throughout the spin. And those are two key numbers that generally will show up in every spin that you're doing. Two continuous revolutions in the position that you're going for and a minimum of three revolutions uh, to begin. Uh, a level base can also be attained with the basic spin position. Uh, but in this instance, you can also get it if you don't quite have those two continuous revolutions, but you do have three revolutions in total. And this is one of those uh, areas where the adult calling clarifications give a little bit more leniency for skaters that rather than getting no level, you've got a couple of options where you're going to get a level base um, before going into uh, the higher uh, level spins. And to get a level one through four, which would be based on your achieved features, you need that basic spin position. And then as many features as you perform up to the maximum for the level uh, that you are competing in. And that goes back to the first one, whether it's one, two, three, or uh, four, uh, as the levels increase. So kind of a, a little breakdown on this. Uh, for either a flying or a basic sit spin, flying camel or camel spin, flying upright or upright spin, no basic positions is mostly going to be level base with the two required and the three total. And then with the basic position, you can see how you can go with the one basic positions level one through four on that. So we move on to... Uh, change foot spin and a change foot spin will always be when you switch from one foot to the other regardless of spinning direction so when you change from left to right right to left that will always be a change of foot spin if you stay in your basic position for example it's a sit spin that would be a change sit spin if you do it with multiple positions that would be the change combination spin uh, so again, uh, no level, you've got no basic position and no not having two continuous revolutions in both feet. Uh, to get a base through four, 
Uh, you have to have the basic position on one foot for two continuous revolutions. And then again, up through uh, one, two, three or four features and having three revolutions on both feet. And a bonus level here, if you can hit your basic sit position on or camel position on both feet, uh, which would be in either a camel sit, flying camels, um, sorry, change sit or flying change sit, camel change camel spin or flying change camel spin, you can get a level one straight away. So potentially you can be looking at only needing three features to move up rather than the four. Uh, if you do this in the same program, it does need to be in a different basic position for that second spin for it to be awarded. And then I'll jump in on the GOE's impact here. There are two um, different negative GOE's that could come into play. If you're doing a fly, um, a poor fly could be minus one to minus three that comes off the score and a change of foot poorly done, that also that's negative two to negative three. So you may be better off if you have a really strong, solid position on one foot, that may be a better alternative if you're having a hard time with the change of foot. Okay. All right. Uh, so to get to the level two in the same spin that we talked about, Again, still needing the basic position on both feet and one feature performed on either foot. Uh, for the three, uh, same basic position, two features, and that can either be two on the first and one on the uh, second, uh, or two, sorry, two in the first or one on both feet, because uh, you've got the basic set to count as one. And then for the level four, you would need three features. So that's two features on the first and one feature on the second foot. So to clarify that, when you do the basic position on both feet, that feature is counted for the second foot. Um, whenever you're doing um, features, uh, you've got to balance them between uh, the left and the right foot as you do them. And it's uh, two feet um, or two per foot, I should say. Um, because of that, we don't know from the tech panel if you're going to make the basic position on the second foot until you get to the second foot, which is why it is counted on the second foot. So you can do two features on, say, your left foot, because that's where you start. You then change feet. You hit the basic position. So that's now counted as one on the right foot. And then you do another feature. That would be your second one on your uh, right foot. Uh, that would give you the level four. If you did one on the left and then your basic position and two more on the right, that would only get you to a level three because you've maxed out your features on that second foot plus one, which uh, wouldn't count which uh, for the levels. And again, a little bit of a breakdown. Um, I'll give you a, a few minutes uh, to... Uh, read this without me talking through it uh, too much, but it just gives a little bit of a breakdown of where you can get uh, the different features uh, on that. Um, and as you can see in the level three and four column, that's broken down to a number on the left uh, and uh, right foot uh, for that. And if you spin the other way, you can change those around. Uh, I just did them as a quick two on the left, two on the right, uh, one on the left, whatever. Okay. All right, so let's move on. Uh, this is the same for the upright spin. Uh, the one thing about that is uh, the basic position on both feet is not a feature for the upright spin. It only applies to the sit and the camel. Uh, so to get to the level four, for example, you would need two on uh, features on one foot and two on uh, the second foot. You're not given that automatic level for having two upright positions uh, on the first and second feet. 
So spin combination without a change of foot. That's the one that's labeled COSP and may or may not have the fly on the front of it. Uh, for this one, one basic position attained for two continuous revolutions will be called a base. And you will receive a V for that because you've only got one basic position. Uh, two basic positions for two continuous revolutions will receive a level based on the features. It will also receive a level V. You'll see a little theme happening here. And if you get all three basic positions attained, uh, you will receive the level based on the features up to the maximum allowable, and there will be no level, uh, no V applied uh, after the level. So I'll jump in. Something that we like to be able to reward is, especially on these change of positions, if you can get any acceleration during it. So if we let, you know, typically if you see a camel spin into a sit spin, if you can increase the speed of the sit on the sit spin, that is something the judges can reward for. Again, we have a little table of breaking it down. Uh, so you can see the left column is the basic positions. Um, so if you've got no basic positions achieved and they're not really visible at all, you're not gonna get a level uh, for it. Uh, if you have one through three, but not for the two continuous revolutions or uh, less than three or not two continuous and less than three in total, it would be also no level. But then two continuous revolutions with one basic position and three revolutions total, you're getting a base plus V. Uh, uh, same with the level two, uh, the two basic positions would be the base uh, and the V. And then as you start to add on the features with the basic, all three basic positions, you will see that the levels increase as uh, you go along. And again, this is to not, uh, hopefully not have any um, combination spins um, with no points uh, going forward, uh, but also to award uh, skaters who maximize out on the positions and the features and everything. And again, it's up to the levels uh, for the level that you're, <laughs> the levels are up to the level that you're skating. I just realized the weirdness of that statement. The levels that you can attain uh, for the spin is based on the number of features up to the max maximum for the skating level that you're at. Uh, so now we're moving on to the spin combination with the change of foot. And again, this can be with the fly or without fly beforehand, depending on the level as well. Uh, similar to the last one, one basic position for two continuous revolutions, a base with a V, one basic, two continuous revolutions, less than three revolutions in each foot, base V. Two basic positions uh, can have uh, with the two continuous revolutions up to uh, the maximum allowable level for the uh, level you're skating at with a V. And then all three uh, basic positions will feature the level and will not have um, a V uh, applied to the spin. And again, we have a little breakdown of the table, which is similar to the one that we just had for the combination spin. Okay, so what can be repeated? And as I said when we started off with this, um, there's a number of documents that are online. This is, uh, is part of the adult calling clarification document. And some of it also comes from uh, the uh, um, um, the ISU document uh, that is put out as well. Uh, eight revolutions is, as we saw earlier, one of uh, the features that can be awarded. With the adults, you can do that in a second spin. Uh, however, it must be in a different position. So if you do it in the camel to begin with, it needs to be in the sit spin at uh, a second time, uh, which is one of the options that we have, um, or in a difficult, a, a different difficult variation to what the first one is. And the basic position on both feet, which we talked about, which doesn't include the upright, can be done in the camel position or within the sit position, either with or without the flying uh, 
um, entrance. One thing that you must uh, look at when you're doing your spins is that all your spin codes are different. Um, so for example, if you do an upright spin as your first spin, and then as your second spin, you do a back upright spin, even though you are doing a spin that is essentially on different feet, uh, it is still an upright spin. And one of the times when we see this happening is if someone is doing, say, a combination spin, and then they might wanted to do a combination spin with, say, a change of foot uh, later on, and they sort of mess it up. So to, to help with that, if the first spin was called a camel spin, no level, as an example, due to an error, and it was supposed to be a combination spin or a change foot combination spin, and the second spin would have been uh, a sit spin, uh, then you're now not going to have according to requirements because you don't have a combination spin. It could also be, for example, that your second spin was going to be a camel spin, which would make the codes the same. Uh, the option is to kind of change the first spin to the intended combination spin and make that no level and then allow the sit spin uh, or the camel spin, whatever it is, uh, to be marked as a sit spin with the levels that are retained by it. Um, as long as it's not something that the skater did intentionally. So this has to be an error or say falling out of the spin that was not uh, an intentional, I'm just not doing it. It wants to, it's going to be something that has to be an unintentional error uh, that the skater made um, uh, to get this change of codes to allow one of the spins to be called. Uh, so a few little clarifications as we go along. If you fall, for example, when you're entering a spin, um, you can fill in the blank time with doing a spin. It will not be called. Um, it's just, in essence, marking time so that you can continue on with the rest of your program instead of standing around and um, not really doing anything uh, as you're going there. Um, if there is a clear weight transfer within the spin, that will stop the spin. So whenever that second foot comes down and there is weight transfer onto it, the spin is done. Whatever you do after that, if you kind of do like a shuffle push and then go on to the second foot to continue spinning, that second part of the spin from the point of view of the technical panel does not exist. You have done a combination spin, but there will be no change of foot, for example, on that one because of that weight transfer. However, if you do the first side of the spin and then sort of wander across the ice to do the second part of the spin. And that would be evident by having an exit curve and an entry curve. Then those will be called as two spins. So you will have the first spin and whatever is associated with that. And then you will see immediately after that on the protocol, the second spin, which would be, and unfortunately that's probably gonna end up killing the third spin, which would be potentially one of the ones that you'd be looking for for that. So it's just something to, to bear in mind when you're performing your program and obviously to work on when you're uh, practicing your programs for this. So what do we talk about a difficult variation? What does that mean? So that is a movement of a body part, a leg, the arm, the hand, the head, which requires more physical strength or flexibility and has an effect on the balance of the main body core. And this does apply uh, to everyone. I mean, there are very specific uh, criteria that are laid down as to what the difficult positions are. Um, and it is considered attempted when it is uh, visible. And it doesn't matter if it is awarded or not. If there is something that has been uh, attempted, say you hit um, a sit side, the broken leg position and come out of it, that counts. Um, if you hold it for the two revolutions, it counts for the sit side and for the level feature. So again, going back to that, we want to get to the two uh, revolutions uh, in that position before uh, we move on. 
And a couple of good ones here. The basic upright is a basic position. So going back to the Vs, that can always be a way uh, to get up to the different, uh, to the second level or just to hold it. Sometimes you'll see great camels, great sits, and then we're done. And we off we go. Um, you want to hold that upright for a couple of uh, revolutions uh, to get that third feature. And it can just be something as simple as the upright. You learned the very first day you started your spins from moving from two feet to one foot. And as we talked about earlier, anytime you change feet, you change feet in the spin and it gets counted as uh, such. Um, so if you're doing a spin where you're um, going from right to left or left to right, forwards to backwards, backwards to forwards, that's going to be a change of foot uh, spin that's in there. So a couple of little things that we can look at uh, when you're uh, looking at this, and this is kind of like the top down and the bottom up um, option that we have here. Uh, there's a couple of different um, options that we have, and these are good to have all of these documents in play when you're putting together your program and looking to see what you're gonna do for the spins, the requirements and everything is look at what the ISU says, look at what's in the US figure skating uh, announcements and clarifications on the technical um, announcement page, technical notification page, and then look to see what it says in the um, adult calling clarifications. So to give you an example, the ISU says you can do eight revolutions in a camel. Great. The US figure skating says you can do it twice. Great. And the adult clarification says you can also do it in a sit spin. What we don't go into though is say what the sit spin is. And that's the one where you need to look up and see how the ISU uh, defines what the sit spin is. I hope that sort of makes sense. So if you're seeing it in there, we will say, tell you the extra things that you can do. Uh, for example, that sit spin with the eight revolutions, which is not something the ISU says. And then you can go and look at what the ISU defines as the requirements for that uh, particular feature or position or something from there. All right, I think we've Can I, can I do a quick end. little blip on GOEs before questions? Yeah, go ahead. Yes. Um, so I just wanted to quickly go over GOEs for spins. Um, it is These are documents that are available if you go to singles rules, you can go down and see the guidelines for marking on that page. Um, the three main, we reward first and then we take away. So when we evaluate a spin, we're going to look at what we can give positive GOEs for, and then we will look at what needs to be reduced. So the three main things we're looking for for positive are good speed and acceleration, good controlled, clear positions. And this could include um, if you're doing a flying spin, height and air position, and that it's effortless throughout. Um, so if you look like this very controlled, clean spin, you can earn those bullet points. There's a few extras, maintaining a centered spin, creativity, and the element matching the music. But those three ones that you will see on the document in bold, those are the most important. The things that we can take away from after that. So watch the spin, reward it where we can reward it, and then reduce where we have to reduce. So things that we can reduce for, if there is a fall, it's reduced by negative five. So not, not ideal. Um, a touchdown with a free foot or hands, a poor exit, that's something new this year. So if you're going for a creative exit and something goes wrong, that could be something that's reduced for um, traveling during the spin, loss of balance, less than the required revolutions, which is going to affect your level as well. Um, a reduction of speed, poorly done change of foot, which I mentioned earlier, and then a awkward position, um, which may fall into like the visible, but not basic, but um, usually has to be a little bit more than that. So I definitely recommend going and checking out this document and it will show also how much each thing can be reduced by. So the majority of them, um, if all the negative GOEs, it's reduced by negative one to negative three. There's a few like the fall, which will be reduced negative five every time. Um, and some are negative two to negative three. 
So just things to keep in mind as you're deciding what spins you're going to go for this season. And also look as well at all the, from that first slide, which is the ISU document that comes out each year and uh, delineates what the difficult features are. Uh, a couple of things, you don't have to do them in order. You can pick your strong ones um, with the exception of, like I was saying, the eight uh, in one position, which would have to be done in a different spin and in a different position or uh, difficult variation. Uh, most of them can only be done uh, once. You don't need to have one of the mandatory features to get a level four. So any four uh, achieved features will give you the level four um, when you're performing your spin, assuming that is the level that you can max out at uh, for the higher uh, competitive levels. Um, and it's always a good idea to kind of balance your features that you are guaranteed, I shouldn't say guaranteed because anything can happen in the heat of uh, competition, but know the features that you can do well and don't necessarily push it to go higher because that can reduce uh, your grade of execution. If you lose uh, balance, you lose speed, you lose uh, something doing that fourth feature, it's not going to help your grades of execution, whereas only going to the level three can improve those grades of execution because you've got a very well done spin. Um, thank you so much for all of all the slides and from Ian and the uh, input from Megan. There is quite a few questions in the chat, so I'm going to start there um, and read them out to you. And if you guys uh, can answer, that would be great. Um, I'm going to start with Olga, who is asking when a combination spin that includes all three positions is called as a BV, what is it that's commonly missing um, to be uh, named as such? Uh, so with that, it means that you've missed uh, a basic position in one of them or you haven't held it for the required uh, two revolutions. Uh, so there's not necessarily a common one. Uh, it could be that the camel spin, the free leg isn't high enough, uh, the sit spin, uh, the um, hip or the upper part of the skating leg is not parallel to the ice. Or it could be that the upright spin is only one revolution and you're done. Uh, you've got to hold uh, all the basic positions uh, for the two continuous revolutions uh, for all three of them uh, to get or to re remove that V from uh, the level that is called. I think there is also a little bit of confusion between V being related to visible position, which I know it's not. V was just kind of the letter that was assigned to a missing basic position, correct? Correct. It does not mean anything else. Yeah, because uh, that existed long before the visible uh, positions became a thing. Um, continuing on and looking at the combination spin chart, does it mean to get a level one or higher, you have to hit all three basic positions. Otherwise, if you miss one position, you get BV, even if you achieve a feature that would normally count for a level. Uh, no, um, you can, you, you would get the V because you don't have a, a basic position in there, but uh, you can still get features up to the level for your um, skating level that you're competing at. Uh, without having all three basic positions. I can actually provide a very straightforward example because this happened to my student who achieved a 4V on a spin. She had a difficult difficult entrance into a um, sit front to then she went, she was supposed to hold an upright position, which she did not, and then pushed forward into a basic sit on the forward side into a camel catch or a camel forward. She had four features, but did not complete an upright position. So she was awarded a four V 
which correct me if I'm wrong, it does lower the base value of the level of the spin, correct? When it's assigned a V? Yes. Yes. Um, um, if memory serves, it's either 80 or 70% of the base value uh, for the spin. Don't quote me on that, but it is listed in one of the ISU, uh, one of ISU slash US figure skating documents that gives the base points for everything out there. Um, so if you look at it, it's a table. Um, it's broken down by category. So it will give you uh, all your jumps from the single waltz jump all the way up to the quad axle. Uh, it gives you your combination spins, your up, uh, single position spins, your flying spins, your flying combination spins. And there is in the center column, the base value for that. And there's also a column that gives you the base V and also for the level one, the level one V, the level two, the level two V, and then uh, what the point value is associated with the grade of execution, uh, negative to the left, positive to the right of that um, middle column. Megan and I both just dropped that uh, in the chat. And both both th that document, I also dropped in the chat the document for what Megan mentioned earlier about GOE. Both of those are found by logging into members only, going under singles and scrolling about three quarters of the way down the page. And those are both listed there. Um, I've also included the adult calling clarifications, which are found under the uh, skating opportunities, adult skating rules and resources. And that's about the middle of the page. It says adult calling clarifications. Um, so these documents are in the chat for you. Um, and they're all in members only as well. Uh, moving on to the next question. If you miss your entrance, but not fall, can you still do the spin to fill up time to not just stand there? Yes. Um, depending though on, and this is one of those sort of things you have to see it to know it, uh, sort of thing. Um, depending on what that miss of an entrance is it may affect whether or not that spin is uh, called or not. Um, randomly, the best example I can give for this is on a jump, believe it or not. You'll see skaters going around, they're lining up, they'll step forward, they'll pull their arms back, the free leg comes back, and then they have a change of heart and decide that they're just going to keep on skating. Uh, nine times out of 10, something like that would be called as an axle, no value. They've prepped for the axle and they haven't done it. Um, but then, for example, the loop jump, you could be skating backwards already. You sit into position, you've got your arms out, you step back onto that outside edge, and then you do a lovely glide out of it. That's one that it can be a little harder to determine whether or not the loop was being attempted or not. And it's the same thing with a spin. Um, when you see a skater going into a spin, starting it, but then aborting it, um, you know that that spin was going to be attempted. So whatever is done after that, it might just be called spin no value. If it's the sort of thing where you step forward and you keep on going, that may or may not uh, then allow you to do that second spin. Oh, not the second spin, but to to do the spin as per your example of your question, which would not be counted then as a second spin. It would be your first spin. Um, <laughs> someone said, how long will these rules last? I'm slow to learn and add to programs. These are definitely, the S was actually sent directly to me. Um, these will be, th these are the rules for this season. Um, they are evaluated at the end of the season as far as the ISU and how we adopt what the ISU uh, has changed or if we adopt it all. So as far as I can say, this will be your rules through the end of the 24 season, meaning your last competition in June 30th. So I hope that gives you enough time to learn and get that together. Um, illusion as a difficult entry, does it need to be a full split or not? And 
examples of difficult exit, which I know from talking to many TSs, uh, a lot of that is subjective to the panel. But Ian, I'll leave that to you. Uh, so the illusion, um, it doesn't have to be, and I believe uh, it calls it as a full split. Uh, for the adults, no. Um, but it doesn't, it does need to show that you've, uh, went back to earlier, that you've got that um, difficulty factor built in. So you've got to have a change in your core. It's got to be something that requires a little bit more flexibility, um, that requires more strength, that requires, you know, more than just I'm doing a spin. You're doing that a little bit more. So no, it doesn't have to be the full split position, but it can't just be a little sort of body wobble where your torso goes below your skating uh, hip and your free leg just goes above your skating hip. Um, it needs to have a little bit more uh, in there. So more flexibility, more strength. Um, you know, it impacts the core, it impacts the balance um, uh, on the spin. And that would also apply to uh, an exit. And it also has to be immediately from the spin. So you can't do your spin, move out, and then do a hop. The hop for in this instance, has to come immediately upon the exit of your spinning position and straight away you jump and then you move out. And again, it's got to show an impact to the core, to the flexibility, to, for strength uh, with the body part, arm, leg, head, uh, whatever. Um, a little hop is probably not going to get it. A bigger jump will. And again, those... Um, can also contribute to what the grades of execution uh, will be awarded based on the amount of difficulty that that uh, feature is showing. Not only that, there is difficulty in the feature. Can you change feet more than once? I'm, ass yeah. I'm, ass I'm, ass I'm assuming this is for a combination spin, but yes, it's you can yes. change feet, correct? Twice. Yes, you can go first foot, second foot, first foot. But again, features will only be counted up to two per foot. So you could do first foot, one feature, second foot, two features, back to the first foot for a second feature to get to the level four. Uh, when doing an upright spin in both directions, does the difficult variation need to be the same on both feet? No. We know no. that to be. Yeah. All right. Um, because the second variation, assuming it's the same, would not be counted uh, for that. And if you were going to do a second variation, um, you would want it to be difficult. So you're not repeating a feature uh, to get the potential uh, level increase that that would uh, reflect on what you were doing. Is a camel sit with six rotations in each position a combo spin base value. Yes. It was an easy one. Um, with a V. With a V. Uh, yes. It, I, I, I'm sorry. I should have said BV. That is what was written. And I didn't read it. That way. Yep. Um, what do we need to get the most out of our layback? Does it need to include a side or another feature? I heard a comment... Please don't listen to commentators. I heard a commentator mention that a plane layback isn't even considered a feature anymore. And I say that because they constantly say that your arms over your head is a, a bullet on a jump and it's not. And that's me stressing out about people not reading the rules and announcing them anymore. Sorry, I digress. <laughs> the rules are not a secret. Uh, <laughs> they are published for all to read. No. Um, uh, and they are published on the U.S. figure skating website, and that is the official publication forum for U.S. figure skating competitions, adult competitions, etc. I don't even do laybacks, and I know that a plain basic layback in eight in eight revolutions is a beautiful level one, and then build from there. And you need to do a layback before you can do. It. And I guess my question back would be, what are you looking for? 
because yeah, um, you can do all, uh, I, and I use four features just because that is the maximum um, that can be attained at any level. Uh, well, at the higher levels, there's lower levels for that. So if you're not doing like the, the novice, intermediate, junior, senior, take the four to a three, to a two, to a one. But um, if you're looking to get to a level four, great. But is that level four going to give you the highest grades of execution? So what is the best uh, value for your spin that you can get? That's where you want to go for. So if that is a layback spin for four revolutions and it's great position and you only got a level base, fine, go for it. Don't hold it to try and get the eight if you're starting to run out of speed because that will only and uh megan you can if you can validate with us lower your goe yeah yeah i was just gonna say there is value in doing a single position holding it and like doing it well like that is sometimes can be worth more than trying to hit all these features that you can only hold for you know, if you're going, they're really too slow revolutions and it's hard to move from piece to piece. In that case, you might be better just doing a sink, you know, one position controlled. Yeah. Um, I'm actually I'm really happy that you asked this question because it's something Ian and I talked about and it never got brought up. Um, if you're doing one spin with two different directions, meaning rotating clockwise and counterclockwise, um, does that get called as a change of foot automatically? Also, if you do it in a camel or sit, does that get the change of foot level? For example, a counterclockwise sit spin immediately followed by a clockwise sit spin, would that be a SSP1, SSP2, and then also same question applying to camel? Uh, yes. So um, we'll, we'll use the sit spin as the example. If you do a sit spin on your first foot, so you're going, say, counterclockwise, and you get the basic position, you hold it for the two revolutions, you've got the three uh, max for the spin, and you immediately exit that and enter into the clockwise on your right foot. So you're now you've changed feet. You're still in your basic sits position. You've got the minimum two revolutions in that position and the three revolutions to make it a spin. That would be a change sit spin two. The one is for uh, holding the sit spin on both feet. Uh, the two would be for change of direction. And because you're also changing feet, that's where the C comes in and the beginning of the spin. Uh, thank you, everybody, for supporting my comment about the commentators. <laughs> um, how do you measure the speed in a spin? <laughs> so there is no, fortunately, I'm not sitting on the stands with a, you know, I forget what those things are called, where I can see how fast somebody is moving. But um, to me, uh, and again, this is like judges where we are less, we are a little more subjective. Um, that's why there's five of us sitting there so we can all make our own determinations but um, you can tell when a spin is slow when it is really having a hard time getting around to complete the revolutions that is what I would no like that is what I notice where it's ooh, that's how that's that spin is slow so if it is not that then it is a faster spin <laughs> easier to explain what's wrong than what is right um but there is no like okay in three seconds they did four revolutions that's a fast spin um but i think as a skater too you you can feel it so i also skate um you can feel when you know your spin is it's moving you know whereas if you're really struggling you can feel it kind of slowing down um yeah, then that would be a slower spin, but there is no hard and fast rule. I see. Now, I was going to start a rumor that we have linear uh, rotational <laughs> anemometers on the stand. You beat me too. <laughs> I count. I look at the timer and I count how many revolutions. <laughs> no, you'll know. I mean, if you're in your spin and you can watch the audience go around you as you're spinning, it's probably too slow. 
Yeah. Uh, if the audience looks a bit of a blur, you're probably hitting the the right speed for uh, for the spin. Yeah, and I will say so. That was for the bullet point. Jocelyn, just remind me. There is another thing, which is the clear increase in speed. That was going to be something you will see when there is a change of position or foot. And yeah, it should be noticeable. A lot of the times you can see it. I've seen it done successfully the most in a broken leg. Uh, the mm. situation where they're, the skater is a little bit more open and they squeeze that knee in and it just, you see whether the ponytail is out faster, the skirt comes off the ice a little bit more, the, the, the blade is spinning on a tighter. Like there are definitely a lot of factors that, is I think is very clear to a panel when a speed does uh, show increase in a spin. Yeah, and yeah, clarification. It's not just on a, it mm -hmm. could be the change within the same position. Yeah, bringing a leg in for a broken leg and you can see it start to tick around faster. Um, I think this is a good one. If there is a clear weight transfer during a spin, this is this is uh, reading the slide. If this is, there's a clear weight transfer during a spin, this ends the spin and only the part before the weight transfer will count. Is this in reference to a mistake? Like if a skater gets one and a half ro rotations in a forward upright, wobbles and touches down with their other foot, then pulls back up into the forward upright for four more rotations. So they get no value because they only had one and a half before the touchdown. Correct. Anytime that you're free touches the ice with weight transfer it will stop the spin so it doesn't matter for what reason you do it um that will be uh the end of the spin obviously if you're immediately pushing into the second foot spin that is not it's more when with that example you're spinning uh clockwise you put your foot down and you continue to spin clockwise you don't change to a counterclockwise direction uh, to spin. Is a crossfoot spin, oh, just moved on me. Is a crossfoot spin judged as a forward spin or a back spin? If it comes at the end of a forward camel sit, would that be considered a COSP or is it a CCOSP? It would be on the original spinning foot. Cause you can do, in essence, you can do that feature on the forward or the back spin. In the same way that you can do a sit side or a camel forward on the forward or the back uh, spin, the first or the second foot. They are still the same difficult feature. So you, if you repeated it on a second spin on the other foot, it would not count uh, as a second feature for levels. It may count for uh, grades of execution, but not for levels. Um, I am just going to go ahead and say that all the there's I think one two three three more questions in the chat, um, and I think we're gonna we're gonna cap it at that for this evening. Um, so just moving forward, does a layover position count as part of a camel position? Uh, I was told that if I go into my back camel, I don't have to hold the traditional back camel position for three, but can switch quickly to the layover and hold that instead. Uh, uh, yeah, um, you, so you don't have to have what we would call the, uh, the classical basic position. So you can do a difficult feature immediately on entering that position. So your, uh, layover the I'm assuming it's the complete one. So the camel up would count as a feature for being in the camel up. Uh, position where your shoulders are more pointed towards uh, the, the ceiling and you're looking up at the ceiling of the rink rather than looking down at the ice. And it would also count as being the basic camel position uh, as on the assumption that your free leg uh, and torso meet the requirements for what a camel needs to be. So if you do drop that free leg, then you're out of the basic camel and you're no longer going to be getting the feature for the camel up. Um, but if your free leg and your torso are in the correct positions and your shoulders are twisted and up and meeting the requirements for that feature, you've basically hit both the camel position and the feature for the camel in that one position. 
and that can also apply with uh, sit spin. You can go straight to a sit side, i.e., a broken leg, um, without sitting in the what we would I would call the classic, you know, sit forward, torso up um, position of a sit spin. Um, sorry, this keeps scrolling on me because people are commenting, and I just lost something that I really wanted to read. Um, I think it was something along the lines of does the torso and or head need to be uh, twisted in a broken leg sit side for adults? Um, I believe it does because it's not listed in the calling clarifications. Ian, you can. Uh, yep. Yep. Uh, you still have to, sh to show that significant uh, increase in uh, strength, flexibility with the movement of a body part uh, and or um, you know, head, arm, leg, whatever, uh, from there. Now, does it have to be as much as you see the ones that were on TV last weekend? No, but you still need to show that you're making that effort to get to a position that requires that little bit more effort than just there uh, for the feature. And there's just one last one I don't want to ignore because it was posted early uh, someone asked uh examples of a level two combination spin and just to keep it quick a combination spin is always going to need your three basic positions a camel sit in an upright any two of those 13 listed features that you are capable of doing successfully are going to be the way that you can put together your own personally best level two spin because spins are not one size fits all everybody has their own strengths and as i've seen supported in the chat taking out positions that you are not strong at are going to be best for you in the long run because you're trying to maximize your own points and not somebody else's and just because you held something for eight in, in practice today does not mean you're going to be able to do it with an adrenaline rush and fatigue and competition so there's going to be trial and error with everything that we have talked about. Ian said earlier, nothing is guaranteed. Some of the world's best spinners catch an edge and don't even get credit for a spin. Um, so I think it's a little challenging to actually give a true example, but build the best spins you can out of those 13 features. And it doesn't have to be the highest level your level allows. It has to be the highest level you can do the best at. Um, yeah. and, is and count. Count, yes. count, and count again. Let's count. <laughs> um, the, you might start before the judges start, and the the counting does not start until the position is established and stabilized. And it starts at zero, not one. Um, because oh. once that position is achieved, you've got to do one full revolution from that to get to one. So if you're... However you're counting, add on to it. So if you're going for eight uh, in um, sit side or whatever to get that sit spin level two, then make sure that you're hitting the sit spin, sort of taking a breath, and then going one, two, three, and then up to eight, and then go nine and 10, and then you can move on to whatever it's going to be. Um, and, and again, you know, make sure that you're doing the best that you can do for what spin it is that you're doing. There's no point in throwing every feature under the sun into a spin if it's ultimately gonna end up with a negative GOE. It's much better to do a couple of features and get that positive GOE. Um, it's also good to do the features that you can do very, very well. Um, I mean, yes, experiment um, at different times to see, does this work? Every skater does it when it's at the competitions um that you're not using for um like easterns or um midwest pacific coast uh to get onto nationals um you know experiment ask and ask the tech ask the the judges that are there see if there's critiques on offer uh when you go to a competition um we are more than willing to provide the feedback uh at the competitions uh when we're uh, able to and we know uh in advance about that and a lot of competitions do offer for offer critiques to the skaters. Take advantage of those critiques. 
Um, one last thing, because it touches on something we've already talked about, and I don't even know the answer to this. Um, in If you're going for the increase of speed feature, once you have increased the speed, do you need to hold that for two revolutions as well? Or is that just kind of like, oh, fast, she can go now? Um, that's a valid question. Um, <laughs> I, <laughs> I assume because you're getting the increase of speed, you probably will end up holding it for two. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but it is a good question. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, it's one of those like you, you see the increase in speed and you go, yeah, that's an increase in speed. That's a that's a feature. Um, I, I would say so air most likely you faster. You yeah. have the for it, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Um, the one thing I may, I was scrolling through the questions. So forgive me, Ian, if you said this already, cause we were, you were talking about, you can go, you don't have to hold the classic positions in the features, but you do have to hold the classic position before an edge change. Correct. Yes. You have to show the, um, the change of edge. Um, so you do have to have a position before and a position after uh, for that to count. But it doesn't have to be, I mean, it can be in uh, uh, a variation as well, either before or after. Uh, a lot of times you'll see someone doing like a camel side uh, to get that inside edge, um, but they have to have the, the outside edge as well. All right. I think... oh, somebody mentioned, yes. So if there is a critique and the texts aren't there, don't the judges will not have all the answers for the level questions. <laughs> I was recently critiquing and they were, were like, well, is it a level four to a panel of judges? We were like, we can't tell you that. So yeah, make sure you know who your critiques with and don't have expectations. Mm -hmm. that I mean, yeah, on that right. note, I mean, there's we a might lot be able to of... help you, but... In the defense of the the tech panel, though, like a lot of the times they are on panels for the entire time, and that's mm -hmm. why they'll always be available. But I know plenty of techs that are willing to look at things through video. Um, mm -hmm. So if and I'm sure coaches at your rank know techs and just use them at your disposal because mm -hmm. they are here to help you, right, Ian? <laughs> Yes, yes. Um, and going back to uh, the, about the critique, ask in advance. Don't wait until after you've skated and then go, oh, can you tell me what I did? Um, ask at the desk, is it possible that, you know, we can get a critique uh, with our program afterwards? That way, you know, if there is uh, a reason and, you know, the tech has to, to run off to someone else, they might be able, or somewhere else, they might be able to get someone to assist with that, be it the controller or the TS2. Um, and also like the chief referee is ready um, to be able to get that uh, set up and in place uh, to go forward as assuming that there was no uh, critique obviously offered in advance. But yeah, ask around, you know, is there a tech at your rank? Can you, can you watch me for five minutes? Can you see if there's this? Um, do you have judges that are popping in and out of your rank? Can you take a look at this uh, and go forward? Um, if I can go back to uh, the increase in speed, in the ISU technical clarifications for the current year, oh, it says for the increase in speed and uh, for the camel set, layback, bailment, and difficult variation, uh, except the crossfoot spin, once the position has been established, a clear increase of speed will be considered as a level feature. It is not valid as a feature if the increase of speed happens while going from one position to another. So if you're changing position and increase your speed, that does not count. If you attain the position and increase your speed, it does, but it doesn't say you need to hold it for the two revolutions. Uh, once you've attained that speed, it just says that you are increasing your speed. Christina brought up a good point saying, she said, I imagine it takes that many revolutions to make sure it actually is faster. And I think that's probably a fair point that holding it yeah. for at least two revolutions may be necessary to see, clearly see the increase of speed. 
but it's not a hard and fast rule as you said all right i think that does it for tonight um again i want to thank everybody for showing up and um again spread the word this will be recorded and um posted to social media uh in the coming by the end of the week or ne early next week uh, again, thank you so much to Ian and Megan for all of your insight. Um, I definitely learned some stuff that I didn't know. So, and thank you everyone for your questions. Um, and if you feel like your questions weren't answered, you all now have my email. So please feel free to drop me a message and I will pass it along to people who need, um, who can answer them. So have a great night, everyone. Thank you so much.